Good evening from Hong Kong, everyone, and welcome. My name is Bruce McFarlane, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Education and Human Development at the Education University of Hong Kong. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening as part of our Distinguished Professors online series. Professor Stephen Coslin is a psychologist and neuroscientist best known for his work on visual cognition and the science of learning. He has published over 350 scientific papers and has written or co-authored 15 books over the last 40 years or more. Professor Coslin has enjoyed an illustrious career as an academic, academic leader, innovator, and public educator. He spent a large part of his career at Harvard University where he was made a professor at the tender age of 34. He spent three decades at Harvard becoming chair of the Department of Psychology and Dean of Social Sciences. As Dean, he actively participated in efforts to revise and improve the curriculum by drawing on his extensive research in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience. In 2010, he moved to Stanford University to become director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences and professor of psychology. Professor Coslin was the first in his family to attend college, something that motivated him in his own words to make college more relevant and accessible to the broader population. In 2013, Professor Coslin became the founding dean of Minerva University, formerly Minerva Schools at KGI, in which all classes are conducted as online seminars with no more than 19 students. Five years later, in 2018, he created Foundry College, an online two-year college designed to educate working adults to fill middle skills jobs. He is also the founder, CEO, and president of Active Learning Sciences, which designs courses and educational programs using cutting edge science-based active learning. During the course of his career, Professor Coslin has received many prestigious honors, both in the United States and internationally. They are too numerous for me to list fully, but include a Guggenheim Fellowship, the JL Signore Prize for Neuropsychology in France, several honorary doctorates from European universities, and election to many prestigious academic societies. Professor Coslin, we are honored to welcome you to our university as a distinguished visiting professor. We very much look forward to your presentation this evening in Hong Kong, and we look forward to being actively engaged by you as well. So please welcome Professor Stephen Coslin. Thank you for that, that very kind and, and generous introduction, uh, Professor McFarland. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of your interest in, in hearing about this. So let me uh, share the screen. So I'm going to be talking about the sciences of active learning. So three parts. I'll uh, first talk about what the science of learning is more generally and then talk about how the science of learning gives rise to active learning, and then give you three examples of principles from the sciences of active learning. So what is the science of learning? That's where we're gonna start. Uh, here's a, a definition I, I pulled off the web. Uh, the science of learning draws on research from cognitive psychology, neuroscience, and education. And that's why, by the way, it was plural. There's obviously more than one science going on here to understand the processes through which we learn. So learning and memory are really different sides of the same coin. You can't really have learning if you don't have memory, if you can't retain it. You can't have memory if you didn't learn it. So they're really different sides of the same coin. The science of learning, an uh, enormous amount is now no, known about how learning and memory work. So learning consists of encoding, which is taking information in, and storage, which is integrating information to what you already know. Memory consists of retention, preserving information over time, and retrieval, digging information out when it's needed. Very little of that information, this would come from laboratory studies primarily, but not exclusively, um, about learning and memory is systematically used in education currently. The science of learning has straightforward implications for how to teach. I'm going to explore a few of those today. Techniques for active learning in particular grow directly out of the science of learning. So let's talk about what active learning is. So the way I use the term, active learning is using information or skills 
in the service of achieving a learning objective. So it's using information or skills, you're doing something with it, but you're doing something that's goal directed. It's in the service of achieving a particular learning objective. It's not, it's learning by using, it's not learning by doing. So it's not just a discussion, unstructured discussion or exploratory activities. The way I'm gonna use the term active learning is very much goal directed. So active learning depends on specifying clear learning objectives. So learning by using is goal directed. So let's pause for a second and think about what a learning objective is. It's not a topic, it's observable, it's specific, and it's active. So look at this example. So understand DNA and RNA. Now, it's not a topic, so that's good. It could have just said DNA and RNA, that would be a topic. So, but understand, very difficult to observe, the different levels, very hard, not specific, not active. Here's an improved example. Describe, it starts with a verb that you can in fact observe and measure the chemical and structural characteristics, DNA and RNA. So that's observable. You can see if they describe it correctly or not, specific, and it's active. So learning by using requires goal-directed lessons, theme I'm gonna pick up on repeatedly. Why do we care about active learning? Active learning is more effective than traditional lectures. Don't just take my word for this. There's been hundreds of studies, literally. Here is a classic uh, meta-analysis uh, reported in 2014 now, 225 or so studies were analyzed. Let me just read this to summarize the conclusions of this meta-analysis of studies that compared active learning with traditional lecturing. It says here, the studies analyzed here document that active learning leads to increases in examination performance that would raise average grades by half a letter, and that failure rates under traditional lecturing increased by 55% over the rates observed under active learning. Finally, the data suggests that STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, and math, instructors may begin to question the continued use of traditional lecturing in everyday practice especially in light of recent work indicating that active learning confers disproportionate benefits for STEM students from disadvantaged backgrounds and for female students in male-dominated fields. There have been many follow-up studies since this was published, including meta-analyses and other non-STEM fields. They all tell the same story. Active learning is really effective. Why is it effective? Principles from the science of learning. So I want to give you three examples. These principles are based on large empirical literatures. They capture highly replicable phenomena. Uh, they're large effect sizes. So I wasn't just interested in P less than 0.05. I wanted something that really would move the needle, something that would matter. And they're very general. These principles can help humans learn anything. So let's start with a demo. So I'll practice what I'm preaching here. I'll do a little active learning. Uh, so let us, um, Let's do this. You will soon see a list of words. Each word has living or height in parentheses before it. If you see living before it, please decide whether the word names a living thing. So for example, if you saw living, then tree, you decide yes, it's a living thing. But if you saw living, then rock, you say no, it's not a living thing. This is silent to yourself, by the way. If you see height, on the other hand, Please decide whether the word as it's printed, the way you see it, has a taller letter that is a higher ascender at the beginning and at the end. So look at the way this word house is printed here. The H rises above the E. So the answer is yes. The first letter has a higher ascender than the last. But now look at mouse, where the M is actually the same height as the E, so the, the M is not higher, or most, where the, the M is actually shorter, the, the T is higher. So both of those are no. Okay, let's, uh, just to be clear, go through a couple sample examples. So uh, answer, uh, living lizard, what would you say? Yes or no? Okay, how about height? What's the answer for that? With ant. And height for dog? 
living for brick. Okay, so for lizard, the answer is yes, it's living. For height, for ant, the answer is no, the T is actually taller than the A. For height, for dog, the answer is yes, the D is taller than the G. And for living brick, the answer is no. Okay, so let us, uh, let us go through a uh, list. Uh, please make the indicated judgment for each word in the following list. Please do this silently and don't write anything down. Okay, let's go. Okay, has everyone had a chance to go through the list? I'll give you a few more seconds. Okay. Now, please recall as many quick words as you can that are on that list. So you can write them down now if you want. I'll give you um, 15 seconds to do that. Okay, so now look at the words again and count how many words you correctly recalled following each type of judgment. It's the honor system, we're not grading anybody. So just go through and score yourself. So how many did you get correct? Okay, and now the key question is, note while more words that you had judged in terms of living, non-living, or more words that you had judged in terms of relative height of the first letter. Could you type into chat just uh, yes, whether you recalled more words um, following the living, non-living judgment? So a typical result, uh, most people, usually more than 90%, recall more words that they had judged in terms of living, non-living, than they had judged in terms of higher, not higher. Why? Why? <clears throat> Judging whether a word names a living thing requires more mental processing than judging surface properties. So to decide whether it names something living, you have to go into memory, think about whether it moves, whether it has fur or something, you know, whether it's an animal, um, various characteristics, whereas judging the height is just based on what you're given in front of you. It's much less processing. So the principle of deep processing is the more mental processing one performs on information, the more likely one is to retain it, whether you want to or not, by the way. So think about this. At the end of the day, can you recall the events of the day? So if you were laying in bed just before you go to sleep, can you think back over what happened? Of course you can. But here's the real question. How much of what you recall at the end of the day 
did you intentionally try to memorize at the time it occurred? So when it was happening, you said, I've got to remember this. So I've, I've done this with that, probably almost 2,000 people now, where I ask uh, audiences to indicate whether they, anybody in the room, um, intentionally try to recall 50% or more. No one has ever said that. And then I say, how about 25% or more? I've gotten three. And then I go down in increments of five. The modal number that people report is somewhere between five and 10%. So think about this. That implies that 90 to 95% of what you recall at the end of the day, you didn't intentionally try to memorize. It's what's called incidental memory. The vast majority of what is remembered is a byproduct of paying attention and thinking through the information or event. This is really a fundamental fact about how memory works. The vast majority of what is remembered is a byproduct. You didn't try, wasn't intentionally tried to memorize. It's incidental memory. So focus deep processing is really important in instruction. Active learning exercises should direct learners to focus on what they need to know to achieve learning objectives. So when you design an active learning exercise, it's really about having them focus on the information that underlies achieving learning objective. Let me give you an example. So this is a debate. So a debate is a technique to induce deep processing of material that underlies the learning objective. So here's an example learning objective, for an example debate. Uh, this is the most neutral one I could think of. Identify trade-offs between living on a farm versus living in a city. Say it's a sociology course, and you're talking about uh, different lifestyles, uh, urban versus rural, say. So this would use what's called a jigsaw design where it's a series of breakout groups, series of phases. So the proposition is it is better to live on a farm than in a city. So phase one, four person breakout groups prepare to debate. There are two types of groups. One type prepares to argue for pro, that is it is better to live on a farm than a city, and one for con. So they're preparing. Uh, 10 minutes later, phase two, new four person groups form that include two representatives from the pro and two from the con. So we've broken up the first groups. They had four. We've now taken half of them and recombined. That's why it's called a jigsaw, because you're recombining them. Um, and after 10 minutes, um, they debate, and they're asked to note the strongest and weakest arguments on the other side. And then they return to the class as a whole each person summarizes strongest and weakest arguments made by the other side. It's set up so that incentives and consequences lead learners to engage in deep processing. So phase one, they know what's coming. So the four person breakout groups, they're paying attention and processing deeply because they don't want to be embarrassed in phase two. They know they're going to have to represent the pro or the con position. So they have an incentive based on the potential consequences if they don't do well. Phase two, they're now being asked to pay attention to the strongest and weakest arguments. And again, they know in the debrief at the end, if they didn't pay attention and don't have that, they're going to look bad and perhaps not even get a good grade. So there are incentives and consequences all along the line that are designed to prepare, to, to, to have people process deeply the relevant information. So preparing for and conducting a debate induces deep processing of material that helps learners achieve learning objective. So next principle, principle of deliberate practice. Learning is enhanced by using feedback to focus on practicing the most challenging aspects of a task. So it's not just doing something over and over again, practicing. It's deliberate. You focus on what's hardest and give that more effort. So the key idea is identify what aspects of a task are most difficult for you and work on improving those aspects. Typical examples, uh, learning a language with a tutor. So I, I taught in France for a year and I, I had a tutor before I went there. 
And um, I would say a word and she would listen carefully and then give me um, feedback, like on the way I was doing R's or U's or something to help me focus on where I was having trouble. And I'd repeat it and she'd give me feedback again and so forth. Or apprentice cap craft person when you're learning to become um, an electrician or something. Again, it, 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 someone is helping you identify where you're having trouble or working with a, a golf coach or any kind of sport coach. Uh, again, deliberate practices at work. Now, the challenge is all those examples are one on one. You've got a, a coach with a particular person, a, a learner. Uh, that's not going to scale. So, how do you use deliberate practice at scale? So, we can take a page from Benjamin Franklin, who's arguably the greatest scientist the uh, United States ever produced. Uh, Franklin's uh, life project was improving himself. That literally was what his life project was all about. So one of the things he wanted to do was learn how to write better. So what he would do, he read a lot. When he noticed an article he thought was particularly well written, he would put it aside. And then a few days later, he would try to write in his own words what was in the article. He'd paraphrase it. And then he would compare what he wrote to the original and notice the differences. And that would direct him where to do deliberate practice, where to focus on to improve his own writing. So we can use this kind of technique. Here's a learning objective. Uh, produce clear and cogent memos. So here's how it would work. Uh, instructors would first describe the characteristics of a good memo. You have to tell them what it is they're supposed to know, the information that they're gonna be using in active learning. And then breakout groups would write a memo, for example, to request funding for a speaker series or something like that. And then breakout groups receive an example of a good memo on another topic, so they can't just copy it, and note its characteristics, identifying ways to improve their own memo. That's deliberate practice one. Then breakout groups revise their memos. Then breakout groups would be paired. So you now take two groups, put them together, and give them a rubric to evaluate their memos. So here's an example of a rubric. So a zero would be none of the following characteristics, clearly stated reason for the memo, concrete and specific language, all the necessary information, no extraneous information, based on logic, not emotion. So if they didn't have any of these, that would be graded to zero. If they have one, any one, but only one, would get graded to one. Any two, graded to two, and so forth. So the rubric is a straightforward way to have them evaluate peer evaluation, whether they're in fact achieving the learning objective, because these characteristics are the essential information that underlies that particular learning objective. So a challenge using deliberate practice at scale, a solution use models, examples of a good example, and rubrics via peer feedback. And we've done this, Foundry College works really well. So final, final principle I wanna go through is the principle of chunking. So you'll soon see a series of letters. Here's another demo. Try to memorize each letter in order. Okay, ready? Okay, how many letters can you recall? If you recall more than nine letters, did you notice the groupings? Okay, now everybody look for three letter acronyms three letters, shorthand abbreviations of famous organizations. Okay, how many letters can you recall now? Did you notice groupings? So this is a bottom up way of doing it, where I've used proximity and similarity. If you notice those groupings, it's not very hard, but if you didn't, it's almost impossible. In fact, it is. Principle chunking. Learning is easier when material is organized into three or four organized units. They're called chunks, organized units, each of which itself can contain three or four units. So this is important for minimizing cognitive load. You want to minimize cognitive load by never requiring learners to process more than four chunks. How do you define what a chunk is? You can use perceptual grouping laws, Gestalt laws of organization, to organize material into a new higher order chunk. So uh, you wanna use these laws before fewer chunks. I call this the birds of a feather rule. 
So here are the two main ones. There's actually over 100 of these, but here are the two main ones. Similarity. If you look at the top, you see two groups, X's, black X's, or red O's. On the bottom, similarity, you now see four, just based on how similar they are. They get clustered. Below that, proximity, you see not eight separate X's. You see two groups of four on the top or four groups of two. So these principles can be used for anything. I call the birds of a feather rule because they can be used even for birds. So here you've got similarity, you see two groups based on the similarity. Proximity on the top, you see two groups, below that three groups, same number of birds, just how they're organized. That's the key, how they're organized. I said that hierarchical organization is crucial. This is a diagram showing you uh, who is playing what instrument in the Boston Symphony Orchestra. When you first look at it, you see three big wedges. That's the top level. So you see a wedge here, a wedge in the top, and a wedge in the right. Then within each of these, this is the hierarchical part, you see how proximity has been used to group the first violins, and there's a space here for the second violins. You see over here, similarity is grouping the, the double basses, similarity in shape and orientation and size. And you've got the cellos and the violas. In the middle here, there's some other rules at work. There's symmetry, which I didn't mention. You see that groups the woodwinds here. And there's good continuation. Those are, those are the four really big ones. So, but you see this is beautiful because it's hierarchically organized. So you can take it in. It doesn't seem totally overwhelming. It's not like it's randomly laid out. It's an enormous amount of information present here. So Chunky is not just for visual materials. Uh, for example, in one study, a participant learned to memorize 79 random digits presented one per second by organizing them hierarchically. So he came in three days a week, at least for 18 months, a case study, and they read to him a digit every second. And he was a long distance runner. And what he was able to do is organize the time, the digits into times of segments of races he had run, and then organize the segments hierarchically into a mythical marathon he could have run. So it applies also to concepts. So you can think about two different classes of principles, think it through and create connections, which is what I do in this book I wrote. So one way to chunk lesson plans, important, is identify where in a lecture each exam question was answered. So imagine you wrote out your lecture and you now you look at your exams and you see in the lecture where you address them. That's, that's the important stuff. And you group those into conceptual chunks via similarity in the content and proximity in time. So those are little, little chunks where you're addressing something that you later asked them about, something you thought was important. You can then eliminate the material you didn't ask about. If you didn't ask about it on an exam, it's probably not that important. And you can insert active learning exercises after those chunks. So we do this in terms of what we call learning sandwiches. So there are two types. Uh, Front-loaded is where instructor gives a brief lecture and addresses a particular learning objective. And then learners engage in active learning, doing an activity that uses that information from the lecture. And then the class as a whole debriefs. You can also do back-loaded, which I've been doing a lot of here in this talk, where I introduce a problem or so much a demo, and then you engage in active learning to frame the problem, understand the issue, and then the class as a whole debriefs and a reveal. So the most famous example of this is Eric Mazur's uh, peer instruction. Let me give you an example. Imagine you have, he's teaching kinetics and physics. So he gives an example of where you have a, a yard by yard, say, a sheet of iron. You heat it up red hot, you, 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 sorry, you cut out in the center a hole that's maybe a foot in um, diameter. Um, so you, a, a foot across, and you, you pop it out. So now you've got a hole, you heat it up red hot. The question is, will that hole get smaller than it was after it's heated up, larger, stay the same size? The critical thing is it's been heated uniformly. So he'll give this at, at the beginning as a problem, have them go into breakout groups to discuss it, uh, usually they vote right before, so larger, smaller, same size, discuss it, and then vote. They often get better, by the way, even though nobody got it right to begin with, they may get it right later. Think about it. What do you think the answer is, by the way? It's larger, smaller, stay the same size. The critical thing I said was it's uniformly heated. The intuition some people have is they know that things expand when they heat it up, so they may think the four quadrants expand and push in 
circle. That doesn't happen. The reason why not is because the molecules right around the edge have the same energy as all the other molecules. So they're pushing out. You'd need additional energy to push in and overcome that. You don't have it. It's uniform. So at the end, he does a little lecture where he debriefs. So we do our class sessions in terms of a set of these learning sandwiches. So we might do a learning sandwich backloaded, an intro, we frame the problem, do a poll, single phase breakout group, and then a debrief or reveal with a poll again and a little lecture explaining it. Uh, learning sandwich two might be front loaded, a video or a lecture, and then a two phase breakout debrief, and so on, wrap up the question and answer, and then usually a formative quiz at the end. So the science of learning, enormous amount is now known about how learning and memory work. Learning and memory, learning consists of encoding, taking information in, and storage, integrating information which you already know. Memory consists of retention, preserving information of time, retrieval, digging information out when it's needed. Very little of this information that's been discovered in the laboratory systematically used in education, but it can be. So I hope I've given you some sense from this very brief overview of what the science of learning is about, how it's been used in, in active learning, and the kinds of things you can do to actually help students master their objectives. So let me stop screen sharing now. Uh, thank you for your, your interest and attention. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, to Professor Coslin for giving us such a stimulating and highly persuasive presentation. Uh, I've rarely seen a chat box so full of reactions as a result of a lecture. So thank you there for, for really galvanizing our attention and interest this evening. Uh, Professor Coslin, you, you know, you've provided us with a great opportunity to engage with you about this subject. And in order to, that we can do so further, I'm now going to invite Professor Chetwin Chan, our university's vice president for research and development, and Peter T.C. Lee, chair professor of psychology to chair a panel discussion with three guest panelists. So Professor Chan, it's over to you and your panel. Um, thank you very much, Bruce, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be the chair for today's uh, lecture by Professor Cosley. Um, the structure of this uh, session is uh, 20 minutes. Um, I will introduce the panelists and the panelists will each um, present making comments and ask questions for three minutes. So that uh, we've got three panelists. So that means it's altogether 10 minutes. And after that, then Professor Cosley is going to address the questions, address the comments uh, as, a, uh, as, as one go. So um, the three panelists, um, the first panelist is Professor Jong Him, and he is Chair Professor of Cognition from the Department of Psychology, and he is from the Education University of Hong Kong. The second panelist is Professor Li Ping, and Professor Lee is Chair Professor of Neurolinguistics and Bilingual Studies, and he is the Dean of Faculty of Humanities of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, the third panelist, of course not the list, is Professor Anthony Zhang. And Professor Zhang is, is Research Chair Professor of Public Administration, and he is from the Department of Asian and Policy Studies from at the Education University of Hong Kong. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Jung Him to um, deliberate on his ideas about Professor Cosby's lecture. And then afterwards, then I will um, have the other two uh, panelists uh, uh, making their presentation. So Professor Jung Him, please. Thank you, um, Professor Cosby for the talk, um, which is most inspiring. Now it should by now be clear to all of us that learning or active learning is not just moving around or keep playing when we learn. The learner is encouraged or even sometimes forced to do something that may not be apparently relevant to the learning task at hand via explicit and specific pedagogical guidance. Active learning is not equal and therefore must not be confused with ideas such as discovery learning and constructivism. These are popular ideas in education, but may nevertheless be related to them in some specific ways. 
this inspiring talk also makes me reconsider the places of popular notions such as learning style and curiosity in learning. To implement these active learning principles as algorithms on artificial systems, machines may help us disentangle these possible relations or non-relations. So this leads to my first question. How are these principles of active learning currently being applied to machine learning, artificial intelligence? What are the results like? And how may, how may these results help us further understand human learning in relation to these popular, popular notions? My second comment is that active engagement in learning incurs a cost almost always for example, the extra time and cognitive effort that is needed to chunk, in the case of chunking, to chunk, uh, to be learned material or to engage oneself in deeper processing. So this leads to my second question. Is there a point after which further investment of time and cognitive effort bring only minimal or negligible incremental learning or being downright counterproductive. What do we do when we reach this point? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, um, Professor Cheung. Now I invite uh, Professor Lee to uh, make his comment. Professor Lee, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kosling. Uh, I, I first want to actually say that uh, I, you know, I have used your theory of uh, mental imagery uh, ever since I started uh, to teach psychology first, I, I still remember uh, the time when I asked my students to, uh, uh, you know, look at the little island that uh, you drew, you know, going from the meadow to the to the hut, uh, versus going, uh, you know, from the hut to the uh, edge of the island, you know, thinking in by closing the eyes and uh, see how much time it takes. So that was a really a fun experience um, for both myself as a teacher as well as uh, my students uh, as learners. So, so this uh, uh, type of episode, you know, as uh, um, a teacher uh, is uh, indelible. Uh, it, it stays with you forever. Uh, so that actually brings me to a very good, uh, important question, which is in your talk today, you um, uh, had uh, drawn up upon a lot of uh, cognitive psychology theories in terms of uh, uh, how we can best uh, deliver effective uh, learning and uh, teaching to students to help them to learn better, uh, including um, theories of memory, uh, uh, encoding, uh, and so on. Uh, I was wondering to what extent uh, uh, the field of the sciences of learning actually are drawing upon uh, these pieces of uh, theories in a more systematic way. You know, in other words, I'm, more, I'm thinking aloud more about the, the holistic set of principles that uh, uh, the, new, the sciences of learning could come up with. Um, uh, very much in the way such as Richard Mayer uh, has done for his uh, multimedia learning. You know, he came up with uh, some something like uh, two dozens of uh, principles. So I, I I'm curious as to how we might uh, leverage theories of cognitive science and the cognitive psychology to really inform instructional designs, uh, so that we can uh, really tell the teachers uh, these are the principles that we should follow for uh, enhancing active learning in students. So that's one part of my question. The other part is uh, listening to your uh, wonderful talk and inspiring talk today also has a bit of a disadvantage should uh, your talk be delivered in a real classroom with a uh, face-to-face uh, interactions with, uh, uh, with us. For example, we lose you uh, lost all of the cues that you would normally get uh, feedback from students, eye contacts, uh, the same thing occurs with us, uh, uh, you know, we don't really, we cannot really clearly see your 
eye movements, your uh, uh, subtle facial expressions. We don't get a recip reciprocal feedback. Uh, we don't get a contingent responses, uh, gestures, joint attentions, uh, share the common grounds. All of that uh, are sort of absent in some way. So the Zoom lectures can never really uh, replace uh, truly person face-to-face uh, -face in person uh, uh, discussions. And I know some colleagues uh, or some even some uh, uh, companies are trying to develop uh, uh, immersive technologies uh, to help uh, uh, with uh, overcoming some of the obstacles. So I was also wondering if you might uh, speak of uh, 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 this uh, uh, point regarding how we might uh, actually leverage uh, new and uh, emerging technologies uh, to uh, study and to understand what's best for effective and active learning. Thank you. Now I invite uh, Professor Anthony Chan. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, you need to switch on the mic. That's the problem of uh, online learning. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Kostlin, for a uh, stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, in your talk, the kind of uh, examples that you gave are mostly to do with uh, the interaction between the teacher and the learner, and uh, the, uh, the, cognitive, the, the cognitive process, how to frame uh, uh, the code and code uh, matters. But I suppose uh, you, you are not just just talking about the neural skills of learning, because I've read some of your interviews elsewhere, and you are really advocating uh, a rather innovative transformation of learning. And I remember in one of your many interviews, when you asked, okay, what's wrong or deficient in the US system of education areas for improvement, and then you identify a few. Uh, including apart from active learning, uh, you have uh, learn objectives, hybrid classroom, transfer to the workplace, and universal learning. Now in Hong Kong, I suppose whether in schools or universities, we have a bit of everything. We do have learn objectives, and we are now so used to hybrid uh, teaching because of COVID. And uh, transfer to the workplace, yes, we emphasize applied learning, applied studies, uh, we emphasize continuous education on conti continuous learning. But I suppose learning is not just about the method or the skills. It may have to do with the context, the process. Uh, sometimes you have all these things, but the actual outcome may be quite different because the, the practice it, it matters in my view. So uh, from your experience, what are the hurdles and how can people help we have to overcome those hurdles, whether organizational, pedagogical, or psychological. And then are there anything that we need to do with teacher education? I mean, the conventional way of teacher education is outdated. Uh, where are, the, are those areas where reform should be kickstarted? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've got these uh, three panelists asking question, commenting, and now is Professor Tosley, please. Uh, thank you, those are very stimulating and interesting questions. Um, how much time do I have to answer them? <laughs> uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, that'll be plenty. So um, I'm perfectly happy to have actually a discussion. So I'll give you my initial answer and then if you have a response, that would be fine, I'm gonna take it from there. So let me do them in order. Uh, a presentation started with Professor Heem. Um, so the question there was, um, how do you relate active learning to machine learning, artificial intelligence? Um, how may these results help us further understand human learning? So first I disclaimer, I'm no expert on machine learning and artificial intelligence today, but my understanding such as it is, is that most of what these fields are now doing is really about classifying, uh, extracting underlying dimensions in data, or organizing material in various ways. Uh, machines are really good at doing that sort of thing. But it struck me, thinking about your question, that um, 
an interesting way to look at it is to ask, what can machines do better than we can do? And at least as of the foreseeable future, uh, what, what can humans do better than machines can do? So I actually looked at this and I wrote a piece for Harvard Business Review, which was published in 2019, I think. Um, we were, looked at it and it looked like there were two big factors that distinguished what humans could do, at least as of now and foreseeable future, better than machines. So think about, for example, um, a physician. Uh, diagnosis is something that machines can do already very, very well. So that's a good example of classifying, extracting underlying dimensions, organizing material, really good. Machine learning is really good at that. But think about sitting with a family and giving them the diagnosis. Uh, it's much harder to think about how a machine is going to be able to do the, the kind of subtle picking up on nonverbal and, and being able to adapt what to say based on reactions and so on. So I looked at a, a lot of examples of different professions ranging from bartender, barista, up to lawyer, physician, and many, many other things, and was able to parse out two factors that seemed to run through what humans did better than machines did. So one is context. Humans are very good at taking context into account. And why context is interesting is because it's open-ended. Context is always changing. Every time someone new walks in a room or some new politician is elected or what, just constantly changing. And by its nature, machine learning depends on data that's already been collected based on previous past events. So you can have qualitative shifts in context. So humans are really good at that. It, it's going to be hard to have machines do it as well as we do. And the other thing that was a thread that ran through all the stuff that humans did better was emotion. Uh, humans are better at using emotion to prioritize what's important for us to do, but also being able to pick it up from other people. And that's a kind of context, right? And use other people's emotion to modulate what we do and how we interact. So that, that's sort of my take on the relation between machine learning AI versus uh, human learning today. The other question you asked um, was about, is there a point at which further investment of time or cognitive effort will bring only minimal or neg negligible uh, human learning, uh, incremental learning? And what do we do when we reach that point? Really interesting question. So I have, I have three thoughts on this. Uh, one, what we would do depends in part on where the inflection point is. That is where the point of diminished returns turns out. So if learning at that point is excellent, if people are doing really well, then we might want to shift to focus on what to do with the learning material. Uh, that is, for example, critical thinking or problem solving skills. Uh, if in fact, we've really understood how to help people learn to the point where 90 some odd percent good enough. But if learning is not very good at the inflection point, we might want to focus on more personalized learning to take advantage of individual differences and in motivation. I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, background knowledge and so forth. So I, I think there's another increment of, of learning that can take place by personalizing. That's first thought. Second thought, for some applications, uh, even a small increment may make a big difference. So in surgery or maybe finance. So the added effort might be worth it, even though there, it is a point of diminishing returns. It might, every little bit might help. And then finally, it's a moving target. New material needs to be taught, it uh, is being discovered every day, and it's, it's not clear whether current technologies, te techniques will uh, apply equally well to everything. Um, we may have to develop new ways of doing active learning as we go along. So it's a really stimulating question. Um, fortunately, we're not in the position of having to worry about it, but we still have a long way to go the way things are now. So that was my, my take on what you had to ask, Professor Heem. Um, if we have time, any, any responses from you? Or should I go, um, Chetwin, should I go through them all first and then have responses? Yes. How do yes. you want to do it? Um, okay. Address all the questions. You still right, have let me, five minutes, don't worry. All right, let me go, Professor Ping. Um, how can we leverage uh, theories of cognitive science psychology? Great question. I've been devoting the last 10 years or so to answering that question. 
Um, I think the, the, the answer focuses on identifying the constraints imposed by the cognitive architecture, like working memory limits, and the things we do really well, like our ability to do analogies, our ability to integrate information into what we already know. So I think you want to look at both sides, the constraints imposed by cognitive architecture and the things that evolution has given us that we're really good at. And we want to use that to further refine the principles from the science of learning. And we want to refine those principles also in the context of educational practice. So I think there's a lot to be said for information from the field, not just laboratory studies, from getting information from practitioners about what's working well and what isn't working well, and to have that combined with what we learned in the lab to help refine these principles further. Uh, I think a lot is already known it, that needs to be refined. For example, something I've been thinking about lately is interleaving. So it's known that people learn better if you mix up uh, problems of the same general sort. They're trying to, for example, learn different artistic styles. Better to mix them up than give them blocks of the same style to memorize it. Why? Why is interleaving effective? It might actually be a form of deliberate practice. It might be by interleaving, it directs your attention to what's different between the different categories and what you should focus on to drill deep on, which is a kind of inter deliberate practice. So it'd be interesting to find out if that's really the mechanism underlying that in terms of refining that principle. Um, okay, and then you also asked about uh, technologies. Um, I think a really interesting use of technologies is about individual differences. So what any individual person finds easy or difficult to learn depends on their motivation, what they already know in relevant domains, their learning skills, which is not the same thing as learning styles, by the way. Uh, there's no good evidence for learning styles, but people do have different skills, be able to organize material and so forth, and other factors. So I think we should use big data and the like to characterize as many of the factors that underlie individual differences in learning as possible. And then we should design intelligent tutors that can create a model of the learner and take advantage of that model when applying the principles from the science of learning. So this would be the kind of thing that could be an increment on top of the sort of thing I was talking about before. Finally, uh, Professor Chung, um, you asked about um, hurdles, um, how we can overcome them. So I, I, forgive me, but I was reminded of a joke. Um, let, me, let me tell you too. Um, do you know how many psychologists it takes to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb has to want to change. My wife's a clinical psychologist, so I, I found that <laughs> joke funny, uh, but it's got an element of truth to it. So if you want to help people overcome hurdles, um, you first, I think, need to find out what their goals are, why they would want to change. Why do they want to change? If they don't want to change, it's going to be difficult. And then find out what the obstacles are. It may be as simple as helping them achieve a growth mindset. The obstacles can be psychological. They can be... Um, pedagogical, organizational, as you pointed out, various different types. And uh, depending on what the obstacles are, it's going to be a different approach. And then finally, help them think about how to remove or circumvent. But crucially, the, the obstacles, the plans should come from them. They have, you have to help them generate their the plans. Final part, uh, you asked about shortfalls in teaching education, where reform should be kick-started. So let me just say two things briefly and stop. Um, I think one thing is data-driven attitude. I think education schools would be really um, well advised to train future teachers uh, to have a reflex to search for relevant data before making a decision or changing a teaching practice. At the most basic level, it would be really good to have data about what specifically the problems actually are uh, in teaching, either particular class or all the way up to whole programs, and figure out how to address those specific problems and how the problems may manifest differently in different contexts. And finally, I would, I would hope that the second thing I would focus on was, is obvious, uh, it'll be a bookend, uh, science of learning. I, I think it'd be really important for education schools to, to spend a fair amount of time addressing the science of learning and how to apply it 
uh, in a way that can help students uh, not just learn, but actually enjoy learning and, and have the learning stick so that what they learn, they will not only be able to retain over time, but be able to apply, be able to use in a variety of different contexts. I mean, the single greatest problem in science of learning is a problem of transfer. And a fair amount is known about that now. So to focus on that, to help future teachers learn how to teach in a way that help the students actually be able to use information in real life would be great. As I said, those were terrific questions. I had to answer it very briefly, very thought provoking. I, I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cosley. Um, um, I selected three questions from audience. Um, there, are, there are many more, but I, I think because of time, I can only um, choose the three questions um, so that uh, you can address them. The first question is from Patricia To. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. The question is, how does Professor Cosley even remember the questions? Is there a way of learning how to chunk the contests, problems, questions, what she referred to, I think, is um, the question asked by the panelists. Okay, um, I cheat. <laughs> I, use I, use, I use technology. I, I have a sticky, I always have a sticky open. And I was writing this question down, as you said it. Um, and I simply write it down. I mean, if you can, I, I think of, if, if you were missing a leg, which would be un unfortunate, you, you, would, you would get a prosthesis. Uh, it used to be a wooden leg, it would be metal and plastic and steel now. Uh, the main prostheses we use are cognitive. That is, we use a calculator and we want to do a big multiplication problem. Um, we use pad and paper, that's what our sticky. So we, we are actually form these systems where we use external devices to help us extend our cognitive abilities. So I, I do that a lot. Uh, sometimes when I have to remember it, I have little tricks uh, where I'll relate it to something I already know. It's a lot more work. Uh, it's much more effective and, and just to use uh, technology is available, even as simple as a sticky on a desktop. Now, the second question is from uh, Liu Ping. And the actually is quite is, is simple, but I, I guess uh, it, it is an important one. So what are the differences between deep learning and active learning? And this, does it wait a minute, differences between, I didn't understand the word, the difference between what learning and active learning? Deep learning and active learning. learning, yeah. So does it mean that once when a person is active, then it will go through or achieve deep learning? Right. So. Active learning is a general category where people learn because they're engaged, so they're led to pay attention and think through information, or they're led to set up new connections to organize things and integrate them in new ways. Deep learning is a particular principle um, that can be exploited in the service of active learning. So those principles I went through could be used to set up exercises. So you set up exercises to induce deep learning. And those exercises should be active. They should be active learning so that people are engaged. So they're led, like the debate example. So they're led to do deep processing, even if they don't particularly want to, um, just by the nature of the exercise, they're led to do it. And just by doing that, they, they will learn. Thank you. Um... The third question is, what are some ways in which we can foster active learning in students so that it becomes a lifelong skill or the position that they use beyond schooling years? So does it mean that active learning is situational within the classroom or no, it's a general skill? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, the way I think about all of this is in terms of Daniel Kahneman's system one and system two idea, where the idea was that system one is, is fast, it's automatic, unconscious, and works in parallel. It's evolutionarily older. That's why I called it system one. And system two is the more slow, serial, conscious, deliberate. And the way I think about it is you want to get as much as you can into system one, so you don't have to think about it. 
So what you want to try to do is set up habits where when you're in a certain situation, you will know to try certain techniques. Now, the only way you can do this is by doing it in many different contexts over and over again. So habits require repetition. Uh, and in order to generalize, you need a lot of different contexts. So it's a project. Um, I've actually succeeded in training myself to have a reflex for critical thinking now. So I, I think there are probably seven different kinds of critical thinking. It's not one thing. They're different, different, you know, kind of critical thinking you do when you evaluate what you believe a source is different than when you analyze an argument. And that's different than when you weigh alternatives for decision there, so forth. There are different kinds of critical thinking. And I, I've trained myself now so that when someone makes a claim, it kicks in automatically, right? Think about, should I believe this? And when they make an argument, I think about, wait a minute, what's the missing control condition, you know, and so forth. So, but it, it's taken me years to do this and very deliberate. It, talk about lifelong learning. I don't think it's the kind of thing you do in a single course. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Costley. Um, because of time, I think I need to end the uh, panel discussion. Uh, now I pass back to Professor McFarlane. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chan and your panelists. So it falls to me now to, to close, to wrap up this event this evening. Uh, Professor Coslin, thank you very much indeed for honoring us today by giving us such an absorbing presentation and responding to the questions with both clarity and humor as well. I also extend my thanks to our wonderful panelists, uh, Professor Anthony Chung, Professor Chung Him, Professor Li Ping, and our panel chair, Professor Chetwin Chan. I would also like to thank everyone who has joined us online from all over the world for your interest and participation too. I hope that you have enjoyed this event and please look out for our distinguished visiting professors lectures, which are available online. But for now, this is Bruce McFarlane, the Dean of the Faculty of Education and Human Development at the Education University of Hong Kong, saying good evening and goodbye. Mm -hmm.